Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we're taking you through the best bits of the five elements of effective thinking <laughs> by Edward B. the Burger Man and Michael Starbird. The root of success in everything from academics to business to leadership to personal relationships and everything else is thinking. Whether it's thinking disguised as intuition or good values or decision making or problem solving or creativity, really, it's all just thinking. All across the board, man, professionals, business leaders, artists, writers, politicians, if you're a shit thinker, you're going to be pretty shit at anything you do, really. And if you're an awesome thinker, you're going to probably find yourself pretty successful. <laughs> That's it. And so, in order to do anything better, then we need to think more effectively. If we want to, you know, solve complicated problems, if we want to uncover solutions lurking deep beneath the surface, doing anything creative, anything new, really, it's all about effective thinking. Whether that's in school, business, the arts, personal life, sports, anything, it's all the, it's all the same thing. The truth is that the practices and habits of effective thinking are what carry these people step by step to their works of greatness and uh, kicking some big goals. So there's no big leaps or flashes or big sparks of just wondrous things that just happen all of a sudden. It's basically pretty simple strategies of thought which lead to effective learning, understanding and the innovation. That's it. And the good news is you can apply these same strategies too, these proven practical methods for effective thinking and creativity that lead to inevitable success in life. Inevitable, man. Inevitable. <laughs> Do these things and you're locked in. And the, I suppose the interesting thing uh, uh, that, that the authors did was they kind of took the five key concepts of effective thinking and, and sort of wrapped them around the banner of the core elements of earth, fire, air, water, and the quintessential element. Many people around the world, they, they rate themselves, don't they? In their entire career, they think and probably wrongly think that they know more and, than they do know and they deserve more than what their yearly evaluations and their salaries and their success seems to reflect. It's an unfortunate thing, but it is true. We all think we're better than we are. Yeah. There was a, he's got a story of Silas in the book, but it reminds me of, very strongly of a story of myself back in year 10 maths. I'd come out of year nine as a... As uh, I thought I was very, very good at maths with a pretty easy sort of uh, pushover of a teacher. And I entered year 10 and we had this crazy Russian, uh, wild, wild, wild Russian genius. And, you know, the first test, I was used to getting, you know, high 90s, if not 100s. And the first test I got back was like 46%. Oof. I was like, what? On a maths test? Because I thought I kind of knew everything. Going into that test, I kind of memorized all the facts, but really I didn't actually understand it. And he wasn't just testing us on, you know, question 1A out of the textbook. He was uh, taking those concepts and putting different questions around them that really we knew what to do. But if you didn't understand it, you couldn't do it. And he was like doing all sorts of wild, wild, wild stuff that I'd never seen before. But really, was it. If you boiled it down, it was basic if you understood it deeply, which I clearly did not. Oh, definitely not by the sounds of it. I was the same. I spent so much effort in English um, memorizing full essays, which is so <laughs> stupid because I'd spend full days <laughs> rather than like actually improving and learning my understanding of the book mm. and then learning how to write better and understanding all of that. I just memorize mm. pretty sweet quotes from Google yeah. and I sort of shoehorn <laughs> them in so they're pretty shit writing. <laughs> Wrapped around this epic quote. That was my style. <laughs> That's a, it's an interesting one. I think a lot of people do that with English. They're like, yeah, yeah memorize this paragraph and you'll be right. But it's like, and you pull and the thesaurus out and a simple <laughs> word for like, uh, like go to the, you know, walking. All of a sudden you pull out the thesaurus and you got this 26 letter word. That's all sort of. <laughs> Yeah, clearly uh, that's not effective thinking, the approach that either you or I took. Uh, if we want to really use this first element of thinking, earth, understanding deeply, is we've got to go beyond just memorizing facts and, and surface stuff. We've really got to understand the simple basic stuff to build a rock solid foundation. That's it. So when you learn anything, go rock hard, rock hard, rock solid. If you learn a piece of music for the piano, then instead of memorizing the finger movements, learn to hear each note. Understand the structure of each each piece and then ask yourself, can I play the notes of the right hand while just humming the notes on the left hand and just sort of play around with it so it goes really deep and as I said, rock hard. That's it. If you want to get rock hard when you're studying history and you're thinking about the Civil War, don't just memorize some of the highlights, the, the names and the dates and stuff. You've got to actually understand who did what and why. If you can actually understand it, the dates and the names either don't matter or they're just going to stick because you actually understand what was going on. 
Yeah, that's it. Well, the get book's not hard, about mate. well, the book's not about how how to learn how to get it rock hard. I think we've ventured away. It's uh, how to effectively think. So we'll pull her back. Pull um, her back. If you think about Waldo, or I think for us, Wally. where's Wally? I don't. Yeah. I think someone might have stolen the idea from overseas. Maybe pretty good. I wonder why they rebranded from Where's Waldo to Where's Wally. Well, someone just, just... I think Wally rolls off the tongue more. Wally's he, awesome. I suppose maybe that's just because we what we grew up with. But the whole... It's pretty difficult, man. Um, you pull it out and there's like... There's there's just hundreds of other people lurking around. And you're trying to find Wally. You're pulling your hair out at this stage because he there's too much other people around. It's so yeah, hard. That's right. You've got all these... You know, there, there are people wearing glasses. There are, you know, cats wearing a red jumper that you think, oh... At first, you see it and you think, oh, there's Waldo, and then you realize it's not. There's so much clutter, all these people doing, and animals and everything doing all sorts of weird shit, and it's pretty hard to really get down to where the hell is this bloody Wally guy. Well, it'd be a pretty easy game, mate, if you just cleared array all the other people and you just have Wally there on a page, <laughs> just, just in the corner. Just on Wally a sitting, blank page. sitting on the chair, sipping a glass of water. You open it up, there he is. Yeah. There he, there he is, found him. Well, and it's for us, it's, it's a similar thing. We can clear all the clutter around us. And to make what's uh, what's essential actually stand out and make it easy to work with, I mean, this is the the clutter from the desks. Uh, if you remove all that, the remaining items are easy easy to find. Um, that's physically, but also if you clear the clutter in the mind as well, you you mm. remove uh, everything else and just leave the essence of what the situation might be. Yeah, it's a good metaphor. The old uh, cluttered uh, Waldo Wally page that in our brain there's a whole bunch of clutter going on, all sorts of unnecessary superfluous things that don't really add to the core essence that we just added layers and layers and layers of complexity on top of it really if we strip that away you know if we're trying to solve a problem and we strip away all of the assumptions and just if we're just left with the core it would be as easy as just you know finding Wally sitting on him on a park bench by himself so understanding deeply it's great advice but what does it really mean the truth is most of us never really go to understand things deeply mm. You know, if you if you suck at something and you fail, you're probably going to make up all sorts of excuses. But if you can't explain exactly what went wrong, then you probably just didn't understand it, and you probably didn't go hard enough at the very start. Yeah, that's right. When the uh, when the math student goes to his crazy wild Russian teacher and says, oh, I, I knew it all. I just I just can't explain it." Well, if you can't explain it, then you clearly don't know it. So, in order to understand deeply, sometimes you do need to go to that real basic, simple core level and really get that get rock hard on it. So that you can explain it properly to someone else. It's as they say, the best way to learn is to teach. If you teach someone something, uh, then there's a good chance you've actually understood it. So we associate understanding with the element of earth. We're talking about in this one because we attain a rich understanding. And if you break that word down a little bit, we are literally standing upon rock solid, firm. Oh shit! I just clicked the button too hard, and I lost where I, <laughs> you're where I was. A, you're on a great roll. I was, go, I was, was fucking. I was, I was going for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rock solid, firm ground, and earth is that which under <laughs> under where we stand. I get it. Oh, nice. Under where we stand, Ashto. <laughs> oh, that is good. that is a that is a good under one. Under where we stand. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That, that is that? that's earth. That's earth. earth. That's under where we stand. Is. Under where we okay. stand. That's good. Now yeah. the next element after earth is fire. Now if we go back to the 1970s, is it? There's three um, three young guys. They saw a chance to make it big. Uh, they kind of wanted to get stuck into creating this uh, new, wild, innovative company. Where <laughs> what you what they would do is they just had a strip of tube on the road, and it would count how many cars drove over it. They called it traf o data. Sounds fucking epic, doesn't it? It does. Well, not really. <laughs> it's a bit, well, it, sounds a, it sounds a bit lame, but it seems like you know something that maybe someone w- would want. On well, 1970s, man, if you coming up with something like that it's pretty lame these days but back then it was probably pretty cool um so they went hard at it man although they produced <laughs> i don't know why everything's so hard in this episode <laughs> although they produced some fine hardware and software and they ended up generating just a few thousand bucks in revenue probably a bit of cash back then for these young whippersnippers and uh quickly admitted defeat <laughs> and closed the fledging business it was it was a failure it sucked yeah it was game over that's right and probably, you know trafo data I don't know what the demand for counting the number of cars on a road is. And they started out with three young guys. I don't know what happened to the third. Uh, one of them must have gone He's back gonna... to something else. But then two of them stuck around and thought, okay, that, that one failed. But we did learn a hell of a lot along the way. We learned a lot about um, computing machines, the, their potential. We learned a bit about hardware, a bit about software. So two of them, they took what they learned from this failed Trafo data and they launched another startup. Of course, these two young lads... 
we've heard of. Their names are Paul Allen and Bill Gates. The third lad is pulling his hair out. <laughs> he's he didn't, he know. Did, yeah. didn't come along for the ride on this one. So these guys are obviously the poster boys for the power of exploiting failure and allowing mistakes to actually lead the way of what you what you want to do next. That's right. So while Trafo data was a flop, Microsoft clearly, they learned a thing or two along the way out of their failure. Now failure, it's uh, it shouldn't be an obscene word. There are a few four-letter F words that are obscene and sometimes fail gets lumped in with that. But uh, generally, it's uh, not as bad as we think. And in fact, generally, failure is often the path to success. Any creative accomplishment typically evolves out of the lessons you learn from a long succession of missteps. You don't just click your fingers, do something, and it all works. There's a lot of uh, learnings, tinkering, teaching, and creative problem solving that happen along the way that come from failure and mistakes in general. That's right. They say that viewing failures as an opportunity for learning requires a bit of a different mindset. If you used to think I'm stuck, I, I'm giving up, I know I can't get this right, then go out there and get it wrong. If you get it wrong, you make a couple of mistakes and you realize, well, why did I get it wrong? You might get a little bit closer to actually getting it right. 3M Research Laboratories, they've come up before and a few. these lads have read the same books we have, I think, and <laughs> come up with the same stories. But if someone says today, scotch, a lot of people are thinking right now it's um, time to go out for a glass of scotch, but yeah. the people at 3M Research Laboratories, they think transparent tape rather than your adult beverage and for good reason because 3M is actually one of the leading manufacturers that anything that is sticky. That's it. They love the sticky stuff at, uh, at 3M and uh, there was a guy named uh, Spencer Silver. He was working really hard to create this new sticky substance that was going to be the strongest adhesive that ever made. He was putting in you know, weeks and months of work into making something super, super, super strong that you could never, once it's stuck, you could never take it off. And then what he did, he stuck something down and for the big moment, he tried to yank it off and it just whipped off easier than anything they'd ever done before. So poor old, uh, poor old Spencer Silver, that was a big fail. But big thankfully, failed attempt. <laughs> big fail. Thankfully, the bosses didn't say, well, Spencer, you're out on your ass, mate. You absolutely failed at this. You're done. They actually respected that he had a bit of a crack and uh, they didn't fire him. They kept him around. They kept this idea around. There was no, no use for it right now, but you know, they thought, let's have another crack. Of course, uh, the story does a twist. A few years later when his, his colleague Arthur Fry, who was a scientist at the company, he was trying to figure a way of just placing um, bookmarks on his computer so they just wouldn't keep falling down. And in his hymn book, in his hymn book. Yeah, him, hymn book. Okay, yeah, he was at yeah. church, he was singing his hymns. He had these little strips of paper that he was sticking in there and they kept flying out and he thought, how do I get something to stick in here without ripping the pages? Of course, this, this called for a really weak mixture. So what he did is he, he remembered his old mate Spencer's uh, super weak failure <laughs> of an adhesive and then um, started using that. And all of a sudden, they thought, hey, we can actually use something that's got a weak adhesive, easy to pull off that doesn't pull the thing that you're, you're mm. pulling it on. And of course, it's one of the most lucrative things 3M ever came up with. It was the old post-it note that we all use today. That's right. It's a, it's a, it is a pretty good story of fa a failure turning into success. So there's kind of two reactions we should have to making a mistake. Obviously, we shouldn't be thinking we're cooked and it's game over. There actually is a path to success. Uh, one way is to think, okay, I didn't quite get it right, but I'm on the right track. If I make a few little tweaks, I can have a better attempt next time. Or the other, in the case of, uh, of 3M, was saying, okay, well, we didn't actually answer the right question, but we do have a good answer. Maybe we just need a different question. You know, So instead of saying, okay, we've got something here, we were trying to answer the question of how do you make the strongest, stickiest thing ever. It turns out they had a, a good answer, but for a different question. You know, How can you have something pretty weak that you can rip off without ripping anything else? So mistakes and failure are not signs of weakness. Instead, they're opportunities for strength because a ship in the port, it's safe. You can hang out in the port and just stay there for a long time. But it's not what ships are built for. They're That's out right. to get out in the ocean and just crashing against waves and going through a trial by fire to figure <laughs> it out uh, if the ship's safe. Hopefully, they've figured out it's safe, but That's right. you never know. Now, do you remember that story back in uh, Effortless, the book we did about the, I think it was called the Vasa or something, some some big warship where they were, they were, it was very safe in the port for a long time. And then once they got 50 meters off the shore, the ship wasn't so safe anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty funny. When well, enough funny times, for us. When enough, three people died. But well, yeah. when enough times pass, it becomes, um, well, it was like centuries ago, right? Or yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, no, so you can stop yeah. laughing now. No one, no one knows who the hell they were, so it's, you, can, you can giggle at it. Well, I suppose if, if Earth was to understand, as in Earth is under where you stand, what's fire? Um, don't know. Failure, failure and you're getting failure. burnt up in, in the fiery pits of hell and then come out yeah. even better for it. Makes sense. It does. 
So there's a bit of a Captain Planet theme going on if you haven't picked up by now. We've done what? Earth, fire. Um, next is air, which is yeah. wind. wind. Earth, yeah. wind, water. Earth. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he, he didn't want Captain Planet coming after him, that's for that's sure. Right. So he called that's it air instead of wind. That's all right. So air is all about asking questions. Mm. Yeah, I'm not, again, I think the, the metaphor is starting to fall apart. The earth understand was good. I don't know yeah. about the air. Maybe you're raising questions because they're light like air and they're raising to the top. You know, a lot of people do see repetitive questions as irksome and, you know, someone ignorant, someone lost or someone, you know, if, if you're getting questioned, it feels like you're being tested. But really, that's the wrong way to look at it. Questioning is really the, one of the best ways to learn. Yeah, in fact, it's more important than answering them because mm. framing good question really focuses all of your attention on the right issues. What book did we do on this, Ash Joe? Um, there was something, Ask. it was like four or five years ago, Better, a, a more beautiful question. Yeah, a pretty good book, but it exposes all of this mm. um, because constantly formulating and raising the right questions is a mind-opening habit that forces you to have like real deeper engagement with the world and a different inner experience than what other people would be who just answer it. I was answering losers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, often it can be um, the stupid questions that are seen as stupid that actually give you the best answers. And it's not stupid in the sense that it's unintelligent. It's often seen as stupid because it's a question that's so basic and so obvious that everyone feels like, well, we can't ask that. It'd be pretty stupid to ask that question. But really, nobody knows the answer. It takes a pretty brave, uh, senior, you know, intelligent person to actually ask the stupid question that everyone's been wondering about and go right back to those core principles. So, asking questions shouldn't even just be reserved for moments when you don't know the answer, like we're probably typically just always asking questions in those moments, but even when you do know the answer, because asking a question like, what if, right? It's an open-ended question mm. and it allows you to see more and delve a lot deeper, probably crack the egg on some sort of innovation in, in a way that things haven't been done before because it allows that blue sky thinking. Yeah, totally. There's a, a good way here, I reckon, to actually uh, implement this. Often, if you're, if you're, say, you're, I don't know, you're a lecturer teaching a class, like the authors of this book, or if you're, a, you know, a, a leader or a manager in a workplace, you do a bit of a meeting, you got a presentation, then you say, oh, "Any questions?" You can pretty much guarantee no one's raising their hand. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, um, pretty awkward those moments. <laughs> Super awkward. They say a better way is okay. Say you're in your meeting, you've done your 15 minute spiel, and then instead of saying any questions and then leaving an awkward 10 second silence, say, okay, now everybody talk to your talk to your neighbour, talk to who you're sitting next to for 60 seconds, and both of you write down two questions, and then it kind of forces people to think of questions because often think of questions is a good way to you know to germinate to brew on the topic. And then you're going to randomly call on people to, to read out their questions. So rather than just saying any questions, asking volunteers, no one does it, say everybody has to come up with some questions and I'm going to randomly pick some out. Yeah, it could go either way, that one. <laughs> they just start speaking to each other and goes, that guy doesn't know what he's speaking about. And then they just, anyway. But paradoxically, when you do ask basic questions, you think, we probably think we're going to look like an idiot, but mm. what actually happens, you're more likely to be perceived by others as smarter and more importantly, you'll end up knowing far more over a lifetime. Yeah, totally. Think about like one day, Asha, you're going around all day, you're answering, you're answering, you're answering, that goes days into weeks. Mm. Compare that to someone who's just asking questions all the time and the different sort of information, those two people get on the two different paths. Obviously, the question asker is going to learn a lot more than the, the answerer. Yeah, definitely, without doubt. And I like how they're saying that you know sometimes the really, really stupid questions that you'd think would make you look so stupid actually make you look really wise i reckon like imagine if you were uh what's it what's an example um you know you say you're at I, I don't know i'm thinking building and stuff i suppose that's your industry but you know there's people in a building there's all these people discussing okay we've got this new building that we're going to start on and then and then the big boss just all of a sudden thinks but how do you make a building it just mm. feels so deep it feels so it does. deep. <laughs> it's a pretty weak example, but I reckon if you can get if you can get back to that, I reckon people look what? like me an idiot, mate. I was thinking my own <laughs> lens if, uh, if I just whip that out on Monday morning. <laughs> I suppose it takes a very specific uh, type of person to ask the dumb question and and actually look wise. Yeah, we'll take him for their word. We haven't <laughs> we haven't done him justice, but really, the right questions can be incredibly powerful tools for understanding and learning, because great questions do lead to insights that really make a difference. Whenever we think about coming up with brilliant original ideas, we often think of the metaphor of the light bulb. You know, there's a, the, the flicker switch and all of a sudden the, the whole world's brighter. 
you know, something just instantly happens. You flick the switch and you instantly go from nothing to something. But really, the metaphor kind of falls down if you know a bit about light bulbs, that a light bulb's actually got kind of like a vacuum inside of it, that there's really nothing happening. It's like this empty void. And ideas don't happen inside a vacuum. They don't happen inside an empty void. They're saying ideas are more like the element of water. Water. And that's because there's a powerful flow of ideas. And that's why they suggest the element of water. You think something's reached the end point of, of where it's at, but it's never the case. There's actually a, a place for every idea that, where you think it is now to evolve to that next step, pulling something not from the book, even a table mm. or anything, a desk or, <laughs> desk or a microphone. It never stops there. Well, table's been the same for a long time. You could probably do it's things like, to a table. I think it's in, uh, it's in uh, Anchorman, isn't it, where uh, it's like what I love lamp. I love desk. It felt that felt like what you run through there. You're like just looking around the room and just naming things. It's the first thing. <laughs> microphone, desk. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Bring us home. I took you, I took you way off track. What there, about but... Apple? Apple Apple's got a better example than a table. Yeah. Well, imagine the first Apple computer. Uh, they kind of didn't do it out of nowhere. They, they had all the component parts that they'd borrowed and mixed and matched and put something together. But that first Apple computer in the in the seventies that wasn't the end. Obviously, they've they've evolved throughout. You know, the flow of, of ideas, the flow of water, saying that ideas today were built on the ideas of yesterday and the things that we're coming up with today are also going to inspire brilliant ideas of tomorrow. Well, think about calculus. It's really changed the world, but it didn't really change the world on the day it was discovered mm. because at the very start, uh, the lad who um, really published the first article on it in 1684, his essay was just six pages long. Mm. A bit later, a good friends Newton um, and Leibniz, they added a lot to it. But then so did a lot of people over the time. So the guy who came up with it first uh, in 1684, he would look at the pages today, which are 1,300 pages <laughs> long just on the topic of calculus. Um, based on his two fundamental ideas mm. is the first six pages. But then you got everything continuing on through different right. um, applications of it for another 1,294 pages, different variations, worked examples, and everything like that. So... There's a huge flow on there. The mm. water started to trickle and it turned into the Niagara. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And it really was just those those two core ideas that took six pages to explain, but that did flow through all these creative mathematical minds over the next 340-odd years that turned into 1,300 pages. And I'm sure there's going to be, if we go forward another couple of hundred years, we're going to be pushing a, I don't know, you're going to need 15 different volumes of calculus textbooks just to understand all the calculus they've worked out since then. That's it, man. So whenever you learn a new concept or master a, master a skill, always think about the extensions and the variations and how you can apply it to a totally different context because you think at the moment you've solved a problem or master a new idea, it's time to whip open the bottle of red and celebrate because <laughs> it's time to party. But really, you're just at the start of, of a great story. Really, our whole life is uh, built up of all these different features, our family, friends, education, professional situations, possessions, all these different elements are always in flux. There's no real normal state of affairs. There's not a point in time right now where everything's finished, everything's perfect, everything's performing well, and this is just how things are going to stay for the next 60 or 70 years. In fact, everything's always in flux. They say under construction is the norm. We could say, you know, that everything's flowing uh, with the element of water. So you've got to be able to, to be able to go with the flow, realize that the good things you got today were built on the things that you did yesterday, and realize today that is a, it's a, the start of the next flow for even better things tomorrow. Okay, we've done the Captain Planet um, <laughs> 4, but of course, the, the person who took down Captain Planet was someone else, and I don't remember who it was, but I'm sure it was number 5 here, it was the quintessential element, it was the thing that can change <laughs> that and transform. <laughs> wasn't the fifth element of Captain Planet was love, wasn't it? Yeah, well, that took everything down. That was Let's the, keep going. And it was the change and transformation. <laughs> the fifth element of effective learning. And it's simple and the most difficult and perhaps the most dispensable. And really, everything else is pointless. Absolutely mm. um, no point to it at all. If you're not able to change and transform yourself to actually make things happen. That's right. They say that the first four elements that we had, earth, fire, air, and water, they're kind of like the instructions in a diet book. You know, eat this, don't eat that do this exercise, they're all the, the steps that you need to do in order to lose weight. But the fifth thing that we're, that we're talking about now is, is kind of the meta 
lesson. It's a thing of saying, okay, well, you actually need to become the person who does those four things. You need to become the person who eats well and who exercises if you want to lose weight. The, kind of the instructions themselves are meaningless unless you actually put them into practice. So, well, whoever you are, you might be in school or out of school, you might be a young whippersnapper, or you might be an old grey beard. Um, you can cho- choose to be a person who sees boundless opportunities, who enjoys a lifelong personal growth and discovery, who meets challenges and obstacles with innovation and imagination through effective thinking. That's it. We need to strive for rock solid understanding. That was the element of earth, the element of fire. We need to fail and learn from those mistakes. The element of air, we need to constantly ask challenging questions the element of water we need to consciously consider the flow of ideas and of course that fifth element uh remembering that we're all on this lifelong journey we're all a work in progress we're always evolving and changing so we need to have that quintessential element of change 